Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started on panel three, the changing workplace. And first of all, we're going to have Tamara Babion uh, doing advancing the state of workforce, workplace software. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you for staying for the afternoon section, for the se later sections. Um, so, um, the past decade has brought really incredible advances to, um, in software technology to our homes and um, our fingertips. Uh, software systems um, that we employ for a variety of purposes um, now have become so much better at unobtrusively monitoring what we do, learning from those observations, uh, presenting the information that they have learned, uh, sometimes even at the right time and in a digestible form, and really making it easy to act on that information. But uh, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to the systems that we employ um, at workplace, um, things haven't really changed very much uh, compared to 10, 15 years ago. Um, and um, aside from maybe making it much easier to share documents and uh, keeping us all connected to our work on 24-7 basis, um, there's very little innovation in those systems. Um, there's a, there are many reasons for why um, innovations uh, in software, in workplace uh, systems lag behind, but mainly it comes down to the fact that it is um, expensive, difficult, and the cost of error is really very high. Um, if you're probably um, old enough to remember uh, the Microsoft uh, paperclip that at some point in 1997 magically appeared in your Microsoft Word and started uh, dancing around and um, <coughs> um, that was that was supposed to be an intelligent assistant, but um, and behind that intelligent assistant uh, there was a lot of uh, very um, advanced uh, automated reasoning, Bayesian reasoning uh, technology that was developed by very smart people. Yet, when it was deployed as an interface into Word, it was nothing but annoying. It wasn't helpful at all. It was rather distracting. Um, and so, um, I actually, my work is um, relates to creating human-computer collaboration. And recently, I have been working on studying visual, interactive visual interfaces, um, because uh, visualizations are a great tool that help humans make sense of complex phenomena and uh, make us make sense of um, a lot of data in today's and tomorrow's data-rich environments. Um, so, but my goal is not to just uh, put visualizations into the systems for the humans to look at. You see, uh, right now, um, visualizations are mostly used as a byproduct of our analytical work, okay? As an end result, an outcome. Uh, but my goal is to um, leverage the power of vi uh, visualization by placing them as an inherent part of the system so that you could use it not just to observe data, but also uh, perform your task. Uh, but in order to do it effectively, uh, it's not really enough to uh, pick a, a nifty visualization and stick it into a system. It's much harder um, if we are indeed after the goal of increasing pro productivity. And that involves a lot of um, uh, invention of new things and picking the right technologies and then evaluating it with users and sometimes reworking to see um, and to change what didn't work. Um, and so the contributions of this type of work come in, in, in different forms, um, from uh, working <coughs> prototypes to methodologies, algorithms, data representations, etc. And if you're interested in more, please come talk to me. Thank you. Next we have Liz Brown from Law, Taxation and Financial Planning. What should business know about advanced notice laws? Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Good? Still awake? Middle of the afternoon? All right. So what I, I love teaching law to uh, future managers because I explain to them that learning law is like, for them is like learning the rules of a sport that you're going to be playing. And I'm here to talk to you about a new rule that is being introduced in certain parts of the country. And this rule is called predictive scheduling or advanced notice laws. 
And these are laws that apply to hourly workers, usually in retail or in restaurants and fast food, people who would qualify for overtime laws. So traditionally, workers in those fields did not necessarily get too much advance notice of when they would work. So you guys have a sense of when you're going to be working next week? You have a general sense of your hours? Lucky you. So, me too. So, but for many workers who are in the gig economy or who are in the shift economy or who are working hourly wait for hourly wages, there has been no requirement that they have advance notice. If you're working at Target or you're working at McDonald's or you're working at Starbucks, your boss could call you the day before you're supposed to be scheduled and say, I need you this time. Or could call you the day before you're scheduled and say, I don't need you at all. And there hasn't been a lot of required warning. So it makes it really hard for those people to schedule childcare, education, executive MBAs, whatever else they want to do with their time. Now, now, there is this new law in place in in Oregon, in New York City, and as of this month in New York City that requires employers in those fields to provide a minimum of two weeks of advance notice to anyone who qualifies for overtime in these certain fields with what their schedule is going to be. Uh, it requires a lot of things, actually. Um, it requires that the employers tell them um, two weeks in advance what their schedules are going to be, but also that they give them a minimum of 72 hours before changing their schedule. And if they don't, then they get, then the employers have to pay a penalty to the employees. So it's a big deal. Oh, another thing that's happened is that these laws, here's a word for you to take home. These laws prohibit employers from scheduling clopenings. Do you know what a clopening is? It is when a worker is forced to do a closing for one day and an opening the next day fairly close to each other. So these new laws prohibit clopenings, right? Two shifts that are within 10 hours of each other. It's a really interesting new law. It's really exciting if you're an employee, really not at all exciting if you're an employer. Oh, but here's a map of where these laws are getting introduced in the United States. San Francisco, Emeryville, which is where San Francisco's IKEA is, um, the whole state of Oregon, and as of the day after Black Friday, New York City. So it is a new and exciting wave as part of the general trend of increasing rights and increasing benefits for the huge percentage of Americans who work these hourly jobs, a way of reducing turnover, we hope, if employees are, happy, are happier in the positions that they have. Um, it goes along with sort of the fight for 15, $15 an hour wage. So I see this as part of a trend of increasing benefits and increased negotiating power for workers in those industries. And be happy to talk to any of you more about it. Clopening. Thank you. Next we have Jonathan Erickson, Information Design and Corporate Communication. And he's going to talk to us about the extended workplace virtual and augmented reality systems. So thanks very much for being here today and thanks to Tony and everyone else who's been involved in organizing this. I'm gonna talk about the extended workplace, virtual and augmented reality systems. And first I'll start by saying, well, well what is virtual reality? And so the most common uh, form of virtual, rea virtual reality is that you wear a headset and it actually replaces your view of the real world and perhaps some other senses as well. So you may have headphones on replacing the normal auditory information that you have and you may have alternative modes of interacting with this virtual world that you're engaged with using controllers and those sorts of things. So here are two examples that are actually from new, more recent projects and I'll tell you about some older work shortly. The example here showing a hospital waiting room is a project for prototyping for a design class. So the idea here is that if you're prototyping screen-based designs for a hospital context, or if you're designing a hospital waiting room, you can actually see what those designs look like, either in context or in the case of designing the layout of the actual hospital room itself, you can actually change that layout and try to get a sense for how this is going to impact people's use of that space. 
The other project, this is just a screenshot from the very beginnings of a project in collaboration with Zana Cranmer and others at University of Maryland looking at using VR as a tool for getting insight into attitudes around sustainable energy. And VR, in recent years, particularly since companies like Facebook and Microsoft, Samsung, and Google have been investing very heavily in this technology, there's been a, a large influence on a number of different industries. So one interesting one is medicine. So VR has been used in the context of training for laparoscopic surgery. It's been used to expose kids to the care process before they go in for treatment to reduce anxiety. And it's been used in, for PTSD, actually, for burn victims. And has been, the effectiveness of VR, having a VR experience, has in some cases been compared to pharmaceuticals. In the automotive industry, I'll talk, I won't talk about AR in detail today, but AR is you're wearing some glasses and you're looking at this room and there's a hologram essentially of something that appears on the table. So you can still see the real world in augmented reality. Your view of the real world is not replaced. And you can see in this example here in the automotive industry, this person is iterating on the design for a computer-aided drafting design for a new motorcycle and can actually see it on the table and manipulate it. In education and in uh, teleoperation, uh, VR has been used to actually steer remote vehicles and also train people on how to steer those remote vehicles. So for example, if you have a remote unmanned vehicle going into a very dangerous environment. And it's had a large influence on a number of other industries. It can be used in wayfinding the prototype hospital and airport layouts. It's been used by uh, IKEA and Wayfair for you to prototype your new layout for a room in your home. And so I'll, I'll skip to the VR part. So here's a question. Can we predict human movement from blueprints? This is relevant to architecture. So using a VR paradigm, we compared a blueprint to actual walking, human walking patterns. So we had people learn a virtual maze and compared the walking data down to about a millimeter. So imagine you're walking around this room, we track your position. You, co you compare that position data to predictions from the blueprint using some of these predictive architectural algorithms. And what we found is that these measures can predict roughly how people will use a building, but not exactly what path through the building they will take. And so this points to, we really need better tools to support architectural workflows, but VR is quickly becoming a very valuable tool in that context. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, we'll have Ivan Fedorenko, doctoral student. And he will talk to us about crowdsourcing, blurring the boundary between a firm's customer and employee. Thank you. The very same uh, forces we're talking to uh, all day today, uh, namely growing uncertainty, and unprecedented rate of change make it almost impossible for firms to lure, hire, and maintain all the talent they need in, within the firm boundaries. The, for the first thing, firms do not know what kind of talent they're going to need tomorrow or the day after. Uh, that's why uh, <coughs> last, last decade, a new managerial practice uh, proliferated, which consists of firms making an open, open call for general public, mostly on the internet, to perform some tasks and solve some problems using their own, own resources, their own, own knowledge and uh, skills. It's, it, it has been termed crowdsourcing as an alternative to outsourcing. The difference is that the firm outsources this task not to, to a particular firm or individual, but to a general public. They do not know who's going to do it. Uh, unlike many managerial innovations we see today, it started not in IT, but in consumer goods industry, uh, with such companies like Unilever asking for a new shampoo bottle designs, or Cadbury asking their customers for suggestions of new ingredients and new chocolate testers. Uh, that's why initially uh, 
it's, it, it has been considered and studied as a, in terms of customer participation in new product development, in uh, service improvement. The topics and you know, pretty much familiar and pretty well studied uh, in marketing and management disciplines. But uh, with the proliferation of crowdsourcing across industries, including public and non-profits, uh, the validity and uh, the relevance of this uh, framework raises concerns. For example, looking at these examples like NASA crowdsourcing ideas to study the surface of the moon, or defense contractors crowdsourcing marine drone development, we can ask well, who's this customer's participation? Well, what's the customer participation in new product development there? Uh, that's why I started to ask, are really uh, these crowd crowdsourcing contributors, are they really customers? And realized, not necessarily. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And uh, how to define what, ki what kind of relationship they have with the firm? I started to look at the value, what they value in their participation, what they get from it. And uh, I realized that they do not feel like customers. They, they do feel they define themselves, identify themselves, they behave pretty much like employees. But one interesting thing, pretty much unusual for employee, employees, is their sense of a control and desire to have more negotiating power, uh, more control over their, their relationship with the firm. Uh, in, this, in this dimension, in this sense, they act like um, more like outsourcing uh, co uh, actors, more like uh, in inter-organizational relationship. Uh, so that makes me concept conceptualize uh, uh, crowdsourcing participants as a special kind of stakeholders. We share some features, some preferences of employee, alliance partners, external alliance partners, and customers. That's it. Next is Danielle Hardigan from the Natural and Applied Sciences, speaking about addressing workplace well-being, financial impact and career growth <laughs> survivorship. So this talk is couched within the larger kind of concept of workplace wellness, but really, you know, thinking about employee health, employee well-being, um, psychosocial concerns of employees. And so employees are, uh, employers are increasingly having to adapt to the needs of employees with chronic disease. And one particular group of chronic disease patients that we don't always think about are cancer survivors. So most people think that when someone is cancer free, you know, that they're back to normal. Um, but unfortunately, cancer survivors have a great deal of late and long term effects of their treatment, um, fertility issues, chronic fatigue. And one thing in particular that's getting increasing attention in this literature are the financial and career uh, effects of having cancer on somebody. Um, so of the 14 million cancer survivors in the US, um, importantly, one in five are under 40. Okay, so now you're thinking about somebody that might have career interruptions and financial issues when they have cancer at 50, 60, 70 years old. Now think about what that might be like if you're a 20 or 30 year old and that has had cancer um, and is now um, kind of at the point that your career is starting and growing. Um, so we really wanted to think specifically about the workplace needs of this population. Um, and AYA survivors, adolescent and young adult cancer survivors, are between the ages of 15 and 39. And they're often facing this kind of double transition, right? They're going from being a cancer patient to a cancer survivor. They're also going from being um, an, a student to entering the workforce um, and being an employee. Um, they face higher unemployment um, or, and often underemployment. They report less career readiness and often have less kind of vocational identity. Um, and this, as um, you can think about, again, the difference between, you know, a 50, 60, 70 year old um, and a 20 or 30 year old, but cancer survivors often have an excess um, annual economic burden of over $5,000 on average. Um, so you can think about what that might mean for somebody entering the workforce. So 
we really, you know, cancer survivors have, um, especially adolescent and young adult cancer survivors, have some pretty unique career-related needs. Um, they might have to explain resume gaps. They might have to face employment discrimination. They're probably particularly concerned, maybe even more so than their peers, about employee benefits and health insurance. Um, they face different work demands um, and accommodations. And they may often have difficulty knowing what's appropriate in terms of disclosing their medical history. Um, so a former health studies student and I, for her capstone project, she was interested in kind of career services and HR, and I was interested in cancer survivorship. And when we talked, we realized, um, and we looked at the literature, that there was absolutely nothing about what could university career service professionals um, do for adolescent and young adult cancer survivors. So we just had a study published, which is very exciting, um, on this topic. Um, and we wanted to ex assess experiences working with AYA survivors, preparedness for working with survivors, and kind of openness to resources. And what we found is that many career service professionals, they report experiences working with cancer survivors. They feel confident in their ability um, because they've helped other students with health issues, but almost none have any specific training in how to help um, adolescent and young adult survivors um, or others with health conditions. Um, they do not provide cancer-specific resources, um, but are definitely receptive to these resources if they were become available. Um, and we really identified, hopefully, what's a great opportunity to do some targeted outreach and provide some specific resources for career service professionals trying to help adolescent and young adults, survivors, kind of navigate that transition um, to the workforce. Next, we have Natalie Berland from the Office of Sustainability. She will talk about sustainability in the workplace. Okay, thank you for having me. This topic is about how sustainability has been changing the workplace and bringing more value to workplaces like Bentley. I will first define sustainability or the triple bottom line. You may have seen the diagram of three interlocking circles to describe this term. I'm going to use three nesting circles because I think it better reflects the interaction. So we all live on planet Earth, at least most of us. And we rely on clean air and clean water to go about our daily lives. Without these important resources, society would begin to break down. An unstable society is not conducive to an economy where firms can maximize their profit. The triple bottom line strategy has been shown by many studies, some quoted here, to increase the value of companies and make them more desirable to workers. Bentley's Office of Sustainability has been in existence since 2009. In that time, the office has led many initiatives that engage faculty, staff, and students in increasing the sustainable operation of our campus. So our recent partnership with Food for Free illustrates sustainability's positive impact on our organization and the workplace. Food for Free is a Cambridge-based nonprofit specializing in food recovery programs. They help organizations like ours donate leftover prepared food to those in need. Since 2014, Bentley has been composting its food waste. In fiscal year 2017, Bentley composted an average of 20 tons of food per month during the academic year. This includes composting leftover prepared food, which is still edible. Through Sodexo's leadership, we were able to kick off our prepared food donation program in September of this year in our main dining hall in the Student Center. At the end of each day, kitchen staff collect prepared, leftover prepared food in plastic bags and freezes them. Food for Free picks this up in the Student Center weekly and creates frozen meals from the food collected. These meals are then distributed to people who are in need, including families, school-aged children, and seniors in the Boston area. Our prepared food donation pro project exemplifies the triple bottom line. For society, this program has impacts both in the community as well as here on campus. The obvious connection is that we are getting healthy food to those in the community who don't have access to it. On campus, students are taught about hunger in the Boston area and food waste. They are asked to take only what they can eat in the dining hall and told they can always go up for seconds. For Sodexo employees, the impact is even greater. They're feeling good that the food that they have worked hard to prepare 
is not being composted, but be going to serve others. They're proud that their employer is participating in such a worthwhile program. For the environment, donating leftover prepared food to those in need is far better than composting it. Growing food is an energy intense process and feeding people with existing food avoids the energy inputs of growing and processing new food. As for economics, the full extent of the benefit of this will be known more over time. Right now we can say that it is a cost neutral program as Bentley is not paying food for free to pick up the material. The material is stored in existing freezers and the labor is the same as disposing of the food. However, we do anticipate a reduction in compost disposal costs as a result of this program. Sodexo will receive tax credits for participating in the program and according to Food for Free's experience, will eventually find efficiencies in food production, cutting costs in the long term. As you can see, these the projects that focus on triple bottom line benefits can have positive effects on the workplace, the greater community, and the bottom line. Thank you. And our last speaker is Jeff Moriarty from the Philosophy Department. Long title, Pay Secrecy and Kids These Days. How Evolving Norms and New Technologies Are Changing What and How People Get Paid. Thank you. So most firms try to keep pay secrets. Uh, mostly they are successful in doing so. Employees have a right to talk about their pay, not people in this room. You are all managers, I think, from what I can tell. Um, but employees have a right to talk about their pay. Um, but they tend not to talk about their pay. And that's because there's a strong social norm against talking about pay. If you were to ask somebody how much they get paid, you, you would be making a social, a social error. And there's not a lot of information about pay available, uh, not at the individual level. Um, so morally speaking, I think this is a bad idea. Um, so it's preferable from a moral point of view for pay to be transparent as opposed to secret. And that's both within organizations and also, in fact, for the public at large, but especially uh, within, within organizations. So in a recent article that I published, I articulated three reasons why I think pay should be transparent. Um, one reason has to do with efficiency. Now, that's not simply an economic reason. If economies function more effectively, if we are better at transforming uh, inputs into outputs more efficiently, that's typically better for uh, societal welfare. We don't want to waste. Um, uh, economies will work efficiently. They will maximize welfare according to the uh, people in the economics department. I'm not sure that a lot of them are here, so I can say whatever I want, I think, about <laughs> economics. Um, only if certain conditions obtain, and one of these is perfect information. So when people don't know how much other people get paid, this is bad from the point of view of an efficiently functioning economy. It's also bad from the point of view of autonomy. So uh, decisions that we make about work, about where we work, about where we move to work, what fields we go into, are um, we, we need information uh, to make those decisions. Uh, and we need information about pay to make those decisions. It's not just the kind of uh, industry-wide information about pay you find in the BLS, uh, but individual level uh, information about pay is useful for making decisions about where to move, about how long to stay at a firm, um, and uh, other decisions of that, of that type. Probably the most important reason that, that pay should be transparent is for reasons of justice. Uh, when pay is secret, this can allow discrimination to occur. Not discrimination that is uh, maliciously motivated, but it can be discrimination that is un unintentional. Uh, when people know how much everyone else is getting paid within a firm, people are exquisitely sensitive to the injustice or the justice of their own pay. They will be sure to raise those considerations with people making those decisions. So people, uh, pe uh, speaking of those people making the decisions, firms typically resist calls for greater transparency about, about pay. Um, and and uh, they offer a variety of reasons for resisting. Um, perhaps the most important reason has to do with conflict. So it is thought that if pay is transparent within firms or open within firms, this is going to lead to conflict uh, between employees and between employees and management. So the idea is that uh, employees will spend a lot of uh, their time fighting about how much they get paid or complaining uh, and asking for uh, pay raises. Uh, so I, ha I have some doubts about that. I'm not sure there's a lot of great research as, as to what exactly will happen if pay is transparent inside firms. There's some research suggesting 
uh, that, that uh, pay transparency in firms will actually be uh, beneficial to the firm after perhaps a period of unrest, um, if, insofar as it requires managers within firms to make more rational and more defensible pay decisions. But all of this is a philosophical question that might be moot, and this is kind of, this is where we get to the thing that follows the colon in my title. Uh, it's because changing norms about pay secrecy and also increased access to information about pay uh, is making the question for firms not so much uh, should we make pay transparent, but what are we going to do about the fact that pay is now increasingly transparent? Uh, kids these days are more willing to talk about how much they get paid, uh, and they now have access through websites like Glassdoor.com, Salary.com, to greater um, amounts of information about pay, including pay at the individual level. Thank you very much. I think we're right around the time that we were allotted. That's it. So thank you very much. Everybody.